Good evening. I'm Jay Kandaya, Interim Dean for the College of Health and Professor of Nutrition and Dietetics at Ball State University. I'm very pleased to announce the first lecture series, a collaborative and sponsored effort between the American Dairy Association, Indiana, and the College of Health at Ball State. At this time, I would like to introduce Ms. Hannah Kelly, who is the Director of Health and Wellness for the American Dairy Association. Working on behalf of Indiana's 800 dairy farm families, she provides science-based nutrition information to the healthcare providers, schools, the media, and the community. She's a registered and licensed dietitian, having received her bachelor's degree in dietetics from Ball State University and attending SUNY Oneida for her internship and supervised practice. She is president-elect for the Indiana Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She currently serves in the community as a member of the Cardiovascular Diabetes and Stroke Coalition of Indiana and the Hoosier Health and Wellness Alliance. She and her husband, Trevor, lived in, live in Muncie, Indiana with their energetic puppy. Ms. Kelly? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kandaya, and welcome everyone. As Dr. Kandaya mentioned, my name is Hannah Kelly, and I am the Director of Health and Wellness for the American Dairy Association, Indiana. I'm really proud to work on behalf of Indiana's more than 800 dairy farm families here locally. Um, I get to share nutrition science and help to connect people with where their food comes from, so it's really exciting. Um, but one of the areas of our work that has always been really near and dear to me is youth wellness and ensuring that every child has access to good nutrition and the tools that they need to grow into happy, healthy, productive citizens. Um, this effort certainly does take the village uh, as we're discussing today. Uh, and hopefully today we will learn a little bit more about one way that we can approach youth wellness as a community and why it matters. Uh, but first, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping items before we get started today, as with any webinar. Um, for those of you that are interested, we have applied for continuing education for this webinar for psychologists, uh, licensed mental health clinicians, social workers, and registered dietitians. Um, so if you do need a certificate, those will be emailed out as a follow-up to all the attendees when they are available. Also, this session is being recorded in case you would like to share it um, or view it again later. Most importantly, please feel free to ask questions as we go along using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll answer as many questions as we possibly can live at the end of the session. Um, and if we aren't able to get to your question, we will certainly reach out afterwards um, to make sure that we get it answered for you. So to get us started, thinking along that question um, line, I would like to start us off with a little poll here. So let me pull that up for us. Let's just get us in the mindset of being able to view. Hang on just a second here. Do, do, do. We'll start with this one. Now, so first question, youth, which aspect of youth wellness do you believe plays the most critical role? And there are no right or wrong answers here. I'm just really curious about the group that we have today and, and kind of see what you think. We'll give just a minute here for everybody to respond. My God, we have such a great group. All right, just a couple more seconds here. I see just a few of you still voting there. All right, let me in this and kind of see the results. So it looks like out of physical activity, nutrition and mental health, uh, all of the above. Most of you believe that they're all very important. I absolutely would agree with that. Again, although there's no right or wrong answers, obviously all of them are very important to youth wellness. So I'm sure that I have 
hold that down. So thank you all for sharing. Uh, at this point, without further ado, I really would like to get started with our presentation, as I'm sure you all would as well. So it takes a village, understanding youth wellness and the impact of an allied community, which is why you are here, um, to hear from Dr. Sarah Lee and Dr. Robert Murray. Uh, first up will be Dr. Sarah Lee, and she has served 16 years as a team lead for the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, um, in the Division of Population, School Health, uh, branch area. She focuses on school-based chronic disease prevention research and policy development across the United States, and her work has provided school health professionals with science-based guidelines to support youth wellness and program implementation. After Dr. Lee, we will hear from Dr. Robert Murray, and he is a pediatric gastroenterologist and was an educator for over 20 years at Ohio State University of Medicine. He served as the director for the Center of Healthy Weight and Nutrition and as a chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on School Health. His experience in child nutrition and health provides insight into the needs of today's youth in a completely different way than what Dr. Lees would. So we are very excited to have both of them today, and I am happy to welcome Dr. Lee. And to provide this presentation. We that uh, you've seen some of this that I'm about to share. My presentation, let's see. Now I'm having trouble advancing my slides, but we'll try one. There we go. Um, here we go. So this will give you a brief overview of the main areas that I'm going to cover today, I'm going to highlight some of the relevant research related to the fact that healthy students do better in school and really look at that relationship between health uh, and health behaviors and healthy students and academic outcomes. I'm also going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the whole school, whole community, whole child model, which is a framework or model or approach and how it can really be utilized for us to think about how we support the whole child, as you'll see what, um, which is at the center of the model, and then talk through some of the evidence that has been built over time to support that model itself. Okay, so let's jump in. I have a, only a few slides here. There is a lot of research that has been done looking at this relationship between um, health behaviors and different indicators of academic achievement, everything from academic grades to standardized test scores and some of those intermediate variable, variables like time on task, attention and concentration in the classroom. There's been a very large um, body of evidence that's been really built up over the last 15 to 20 years. So one of the areas I wanted to point out um, that we have done at CDC, taking large samples of over 15,000 high school students across the United States um, and looking at survey data where high school students, ninth through 12th grade, respond to questions about their health behaviors. So everything from physical activity and dietary behaviors, as well as sleep, um, alcohol use, uh, injury and violence prevention behaviors, it, it runs across a multitude of different behaviors that the Youth Risk Behavior Survey asks about. And more recently, we have frequently started asking students to, um, all, to report on their grades as well. So this gives a screenshot for you of fact sheets that we just recently released that reflect the 2019 data from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey or YRBS. Um, and if you look from left to right, it's dietary behaviors fact sheet, the physical activity, as well as sedentary behaviors, um, and then other behaviors. In this case, we included getting eight or more hours of sleep um, and seeing a dentist. So just wanted to highlight a few of these. I strongly encourage you to look at the web link that's in this slide and take a deeper dive into each of these fact sheets and those that you are more interested in. But I'm just going to zone in on those key finding sections of these fact sheets. 
So you can see on the one with dietary behaviors compared to students with lower grades, um, and we lumped those together, the Ds and the Fs and the Cs. Um, so compared to students with lower grades, students with higher grades that fall into the A and B category in particular, were more likely to eat breakfast on all seven days, which we know is critically important, um, eat fruit or drink 100% fruit juice one or more times per day, eat vegetables one or more times per day, and not, not drink um, a can, a bottle, or a glass of soda or pop. And in the middle, looking at physical activity, compared to students with lower grades, students with higher grades are more likely to engage in the recommended amounts of physical activity, which is 60 minutes on all seven days, and play on, one, or, and play on at least one sports team. Stu those students with higher grades are less likely to watch television for three or more hours per day and less likely to watch, or sorry, play video games or use a computer three or more hours a day. So you can see these very similar trends when we're looking at healthy and less healthy behaviors and the direction of association between those behaviors and academic grades. This is an infographic I thought you all would find useful. So the previous slide really was data heavy and data driven, even though it had some nice data visualization. But this is a nice infographic that really hones in on the findings of not just those um, YRBS analyses, but also really a synthesis of studies that have been conducted, as I said, over the last 15 or 20 years. And it really points out that students that are physically active, eating breakfast and healthy foods and managing their chronic health conditions like asthma or diabetes have been shown across multiple studies to have increased test scores, better grades, increased school attendance, and improved classroom behavior. So those items such as time on task and concentration and attention and focus within the classroom setting. So now I'm going to turn the attention to the whole school, whole community, whole child model, which is a lot to say. So we say WISC um, for short. And before I dive into describing the model, I really want to hone in on the fact that this is a student-centered approach to student to school health and education. And it's really a blending of um, ASCD, which is a large education organization that has a very large and very diverse um, set of members from the education community and CDC. So we collaborated with ASCD, they had a whole child initiative and we formally had what was called the coordinated school health model. So we worked very closely together and essentially synergized these two models. And so what I'm going to do is go from the outside in and talk through the model in a little more detail. As you can see with the gold bands um, that state community, this is really reflective of the fact that wherever we are in a, a school lives within a community. It is placed within a community. It is there to serve the children and the families of the community. And that's really supposed to represent that, that, um, that visual of, of the community really wrapping around and supporting the school community. As you move into the next layer, of the blue pieces, these are really the core components of the WISC model. And these components are where we talk with and train schools and other um, education organizations on the different types of strategies, activities, policies, and programs that can be implemented across all of those 10 components to address the whole child, which is in the center of the model. So I'm not going to go into every single component, but you can see there is health education, physical education and activity, nutrition environment and services, the social and emotional climate, employee wellness, counseling, psychological and social services, et cetera. All of these are often within a school, either through a department or a division within a school or a school district, um, or they are, just part of the school culture, things like family engagement, whether it be through PTAs or family nights or other activities that are just constantly in place within a school setting. So thinking about it in that way often helps us wrap our minds around how could we actually have ten, a 10 component model that we address and we use 
to implement a lot of activities and strategies. But the, the fact is many of those pieces and many of those components are already in place and part of a school. This model and approach helps us really think about the synergistic effect of working across and within all components. And of course, at the center of the model is um, the child. And this is reflective of ASCD's whole child initiative. And those five pieces in green surrounding the child are those tenets that are critical for students to achieve and thrive from both a learning and a health perspective. Healthy and safe environment, healthy opportunities and behaviors um, and policies, they're challenged, they're supported, and they're engaged. So that gives you a really big kind of high level view of what the WISC model is and the intent and really the spirit of it. So now I'm going to walk through some different um, pieces, both of evidence, as well as some of the tools and resources that have since been created. So in 2015, which is wild to think about that being just over five years ago already, but there was an entire um, special supplement in the Journal of School Health that was dedicated to articles in support of the WISP model. Every article in there was based on the evidence to date to support each component of WISC, but also the overarching framework and approach um, through which WISC was created. One of the articles in the third bullet down really highlights lessons learned from both the whole child initiative of ASCD and the coordinated school health model and approach that CDC had developed and led for a couple of decades before the WISC model. I encourage you to take a look at this. It is available online at our website, which I'll share um, near the end of my presentation. Um, it is, it's still very, very relevant, even though it was published just, published just over five years ago, it really lays out the foundation for how WISC was formed and why it's critical to um, school and student health and academic achievement. This is, let me actually back up one, here we go. So the second bullet here is, um, I noted health and academics. And so some colleagues um, of mine working with some others from different universities wrote one of the articles in that special issue and focused on where the evidence is around every WISC component and when strategies and activities are implemented, where do we have a positive association between that WISC component and these other indicators of academic achievement, including performance, which are things like grades, test scores, et cetera. Education behavior, that's things like attendance and being on time. Um, and then the cognitive skills and attitudes are those items that we've mentioned, time on task and concentration. You can see um, really across the board, the the evidence is very strong, um, just where those X's are in the column, um, for that relationship between those WISC components and each of those indicators of academic achievement, where we're still in need of more research. And so any researchers out there, evaluators out there is school employee wellness. There's a really big body of evidence around employee wellness in general in corporate or small business settings. We still have a need for more um, more research within the school setting. Um, but you can see as we move down, that's where it doesn't mean that there's not an association in some cases. It just might mean we don't have enough um, studies to draw that conclusion. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to now highlight moving from the conceptual model into some of the research synthesis work that's been done to look at that relationship between those WISC components and educational outcomes, how do we then translate that into some practical tools and resources? And this is one part of the job that I just love um, at CDC is taking science and really translating it to be meaningful and practical and useful. So one of those tools, hopefully some of you have heard of is the School Health Index. The School Health Index was last um, update in 2017. We are about due for another update. We usually do it every three to five years. And when we updated it in 2017, we did that to reflect the 10 component WISC model. The School Health Index is a self-assessment and planning tool for schools to use to identify strengths and gaps and weaknesses related to evidence-based school health policies, practices, and programs. So it guides a school health team ideally 
through an assessment process and some action planning to identify where to address and prioritize their greatest needs. One of my favorite um, online interactive tools is called the Virtual Healthy School. So the Virtual Healthy School really takes these recommendations we have around a WISC framework or approach and makes it come to life in this virtual platform. So when you go to the website, you can click into any different room. You can click of the school, you can click on any of the components of the WISC model. And as you hover over, we don't have enough time for me to do a full demo, um, but do check it out because as you hover over items, it will then give the best practice, it will give the evidence-based policy, and it's really exciting because this has um, been a, a very popular tool and it's, it's really one of those things that makes WISC come to life in my mind. There are two websites at CDC that you will find have a lot of different um, school and youth-based health information tools and resources. So the one on the left is cdc.gov slash healthy schools. And the one on the right is cdc.gov slash healthy use slash healthy youth. Both of these websites contain a multitude of resources and tools. Um, as I mentioned, broad to school health and youth risk um, and health behaviors, as well as WISC in particular. So one of the other um, favorite things that we have been part of is going into some schools to see WISC truly come to life and, and to have policies, practices, and programs developed and implemented in a real world setting. So we did practice this before we started the webinar and I hope that, um, that we are successful in making this happen. And Hannah, if you can't hear it once it starts, Can you hear it? It sounds okay. great, Dr. Lee. Health and wellness are an integral part of what we do because we see what we do as being key to kids being academically successful. We have to address the needs of the whole child. We want them to leave their problems at the door so many times so that they can come in and they can learn. But the truth of the matter is they can't leave all of their problems at the door. They bring them to the school. And I think the schools are now responsible for trying to make sure that they deal with those issues. By looking at what the research says, it's easy to see that in order to get kids where we want them to be, we have to make sure their basic needs are met. And the WISC approach helps us to be able to do that. I have learned through my time as curriculum director, it's near impossible for us to separate out school from home from community. And so what I love about this model is that it doesn't separate those things out. It, it marries all of those. But I think you certainly need at least one consistent administrator who's there and who's not just there to sign off on it, but who really believes in it. The WISC model helps kids to be more academically prepared, but it also helps them to be happier and healthier within the school. For example, when I talk about breakfast in the classroom, how many more kids come to school on time? How many more kids are here ready for learning? How does that impact their day? That doesn't necessarily correlate into a test score today, but over a long period of time, it helps kids be more successful. As a superintendent, it really is my responsibility to make sure that the system is functioning in a way that students, that there are protocols, that there are um, fiscal allocations, that there's policy in place. And so it really has become a calling of mine to make sure that for my community, health and wellness is at the top of everybody's list. Big ships turn slowly and it takes time for that philosophy and that culture to build. We have been able to meet the needs of students on a health and wellness level, emotional level, physical level, nutrition level, and we haven't gone backwards. Our kids get 45 minutes of physical activity every day. It hasn't impacted their academics negatively. 
The administrative support is so important because if there's any physical changes that need to take in the building or if you're changing a policy or even changing the lunch time that kids can go outside, administration has to be involved. I feel very fortunate that we've had strong administrative support, definitely supporting the decisions made. What is it that we can provide in terms of background knowledge for the teachers or professional development so that they understand the importance of what we're doing? But the why is a big part of ensuring that you have teacher support. I'm very proud of the fact that from top-down administration, they're very supportive of the whole child, and they really want to see each of the children here supported, however that looks. So I really have, have had the opportunity to look at various resources, uh, go to different trainings, and whatnot. Giving the teachers that freedom to navigate and research and find outlets. And I think that it's a mindset. If a teacher is in this mindset of restriction and I have to follow this mold or this protocol, you're not going to get that creativity. You're not going to get that teacher that's going to take that initiation to go out and find programs. We have teachers who are really into health and wellness, whether it's bringing in a farm to school program at our middle school or uh, planting fruits and vegetables in, in a vegetable garden right on school grounds. And so I think you'll find that you have a lot of staff who are already inspired around this work. Just opening up the world of an educator to see that it's more than just uh, data on a sheet of paper and how much kids are learning. And it's, it's as important to open their eyes to a different way to live that could help them to be healthier throughout their lives. What I like about the WISC model is that it helps me to empower people, see a change in people's lives that happens right in front of me that's bigger than just academics. And we're the ones who have to make the decisions and the choices and take the action that's going to improve the lives of kids. Because they're 100% of our future, and we owe it to them to give them the best of our abilities to help them reach their greatest potential. Making sure I'm back here on my slides. Yes? Yes, it looks great, okay. Dr. Lee. Great. Well, that's really the coming to life of the WISC model more than anything I showed you before is schools and school districts really making it happen by putting the child in the center and addressing student and school health in a comprehensive way. So I hope you enjoyed that. There are even more videos at the link um, below on the slide and others here that you can follow up with. And I just have a few additional slides before I turn it over to Dr. Murray. Um, one of the things that is really pressing right now and was before the pandemic is the social, emotional, and mental health of students and staff. I'm going to focus mostly on students for the next few slides. Um, we really recognize and have been doing a lot to evaluate and address these needs within school settings from CDC, as well as with multitude of partners. Um, we know that school closures or, you know, even moving into a hybrid is often challenging on multiple levels, and it and really it has impacted um, social and emotional health across the country. And so some of these pieces I'm going to share um, in the upcoming slides really reflect some of this, the research we've been doing mostly within the last year to uh, um, examine the issue. So hot off the press, I was saying to Hannah, I get to add this to my slide, which is really exciting. Um, we recently, just a couple hours ago recent, um, released a paper in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. The link to the full article is at the bottom of the slide. This study focused on data collection in the fall, just shortly after um, school started, pulled a nationally representative sample um, of and surveyed parents and children ages 5 to 12. And we um, asked a lot of questions. And so this paper really looks at some of the initial, um, initial results. Uh, just over 45% reported that their children at that time in the fall received virtual instruction only. Um, 31 received in-person only, and just over 23 
receive combined virtual and in-person or what we often hear of as hybrid. We looked at a lot of indicators of stress and anxiety as reported by the parents both of, for themselves as well as their children. Um, top line finding I wanted to share is that virtual instruction might present more risks um, based on our analysis within this study than does in-person instruction related to both child and, and parental mental and emotional health and some health supporting behaviors. And so there were significant differences, particularly um, among those in the virtual instruction only were um, stronger reports of um, emotional and mental distress um, of both the parent and child. And we also asked a question about physical activity, asking parents to report about their child's activity level. And those with children and virtual only reported significantly less physical activity among their children. Last fall, we also looked at um, youth risk behavior survey data or YRBS data, looking at um, dietary behaviors um, as well as physical activity behaviors. I see that that's not part of um, my title. Um, and the association with indicators of mental health and suicide risk. And by and large, almost every single variable we looked at as, with dietary as well as physical activity, there was an association with indicators of mental health and suicide risk. The unhealthier behaviors had a stronger association to poor mental health indicators and suicide risk. So when we think about how to address the, the crisis of social, emotional, and mental health that's happening and that was happening before the pandemic, and we're seeing and, and learning from more research during the pandemic that it has worsened, we have to think about ways that we can utilize WISC and in particular looking through the social emotional climate and learning component within the WISC model. These are some of the overarching strategies that we recommend is selecting and developing evidence-based SEL curricula that emphasize competencies among students, integrate SEL skill building, modeling, practice and assessment across all of the academic and WISC areas, strengthening teacher, staff, and administrator core competencies related to social, emotional, and mental health, and fostering safe and inclusive learning environments and engaging families and communities. So a lot of this cuts across some different parts of WISC. You can see here in this slide that this is just an example of a district who might have a goal to increase school connect connectedness um, among their students and that the health priority within this district goal is social and emotional health. And I'm not going to go into detail because my time is almost um, coming to a close, but this just shows some examples across the WISC model. When you have a goal of increased connectedness, it doesn't just have to come within the social and emotional climate component. It really can be built across that whole WISC model and across the entire school environment. So being able to implement teamwork and sportsmanship and, and supervision within physical activity, eliminate practices that identify or shame students within school meal programs, using evidence and skills-based health education curriculum that has an emphasis on social and emotional health. All of these types of strategies can be built across the WISC model to increase connectedness and then address the priority of social and emotional health of students. The last resource I wanted to share is a recently released issue brief that focuses on the connections between school nutrition, environment and services, and the social and emotional climate and social and emotional learning. This brief can be found at the link below. I'm not going to go into great detail because I'm prompting you to go and check it out. But in essence, it really lays out the social and emotional competencies and ways in which the nutrition environment and nutrition services and programs in a, in a school really reinforce and even um, address many of those social emotional competencies. Okay, so that is the end of my piece. I really appreciate being invited um, to be part of this event. There is my email address if you have any questions directly and the website um, for the division that I am in at CDC. And now I'm turning it back to Hannah, correct Hannah? Or am I yes. turning it directly to Bob? 
<laughs> That's great, Dr. Okay. Lee. Thank you so much for your presentation there. And we will get, we'll take just a second here so that Dr. Murray can uh, start sharing his screen for us. We good, Anna? Yes, I can see it very well. It looks great. Okay, good. Well, uh, thank you. And thanks, Sarah, for going through all that information about the whole child model. You know, we've looked to the CDC and school uh, health and school nutrition going back decades. And <clears throat> this model in particular, I think, is one of the models that really shows um, how science is shaping our understanding of learning. So I want to talk about a little bit more about the science and how we're bringing pieces of science into an understanding of how they support learning in a child and how this all fits into the model. Every one of these blue boxes has its own literature and it's used to be, we would say a healthy student is a better learner, but each of these boxes and particularly the composite of all of these boxes has given us very strong scientific data that that is definitely true. One of the reasons we have so much new data is that um, technology is changing so fast. Uh, you know, uh, we never used to be able to approach uh, the thinking of an infant as they were uh, doing things. But as you can see, we have these new helmets and things that give us um, uh, means of watching them learn. And that this has been true for kids uh, and adults uh, now for the past few decades, giving us a very rich research base. Here's some of the things we've learned about cognition and how we develop cognition. Uh, if I show this picture on the left here of this little child playing with beans in a Tupperware bowl, and I ask any parent in the country, almost every one of them will say the child is playing. But what I wanna convince you is this child is not playing, this child is studying, and they're studying extremely hard all day, every day, everything they're doing is trying to put the universe together in their own mind using their limited skills uh, and their five senses. So this is the basis for all cognition is the sensory and motor learning. And it isn't just during playtime, it happens during mealtime as well. The child is all in with sensory motor exploration with new food, as well as with new environments around them. Well, out of this and built on this sensory motor expo exploration, we develop language skills and we develop uh, the motor skills for writing and we develop later abstract thinking and uh, much more complex interactions as we go along. So it's all built on this early exploration. One of the things we've learned in watching this happen in young children is that the brain does not grow homogeneously. It's not like a mushroom that just gets bigger and bigger. In fact, it grows in different areas at different times and under different stimuli. And one of the things we realized was that early in life, particularly in the second, third, fourth year, the midbrain uh, really grows more quickly than the rest of the brain. The midbrain is a particularly unique area. It has the hypothalamus, which is our uh, stress center and the center that seeks to get us back into uh, balance uh, every day. But it also has the amygdala right next to it, which is the emotional center of the brain. And because this develops really quickly, parents realize that their little cute 12 month old smiling dimpled baby suddenly turns into Godzilla in the second and third year because they're very emotional. They have outbursts that seem inexplicable to parents. They're anxious, they're impulsive, they're inattentive. This is a, a child, this is a very normal development in children and it is something that becomes kind of a characteristic of their personality at a certain age. They'll replicate this midbrain growth 
not quite to the same extent in their teen years. So we have the terrible twos and we have the terrible teens. The thing that makes that come under control is the front brain. And that's the part of the brain that really makes us human. The front brain is a very different personality. It develops slowly. It takes practice. It takes a good environment and good nurturing. But the front brain is calm. It's calculating. It plans ahead by asking, what if I do this instead of doing that? And it doesn't require people to do everything. They can think through these uh, scenarios. It allows them to multitask, to work together on a team and be adaptable, and to learn from their mistakes. These are called executive functions. And the front brain, the prefrontal cortex, is called the executive center of the brain. This is an extremely important component of early childhood and middle childhood. And you can see here on the upper graph, the brain is not fully developed and wired and executive functions are not fully developed until our mid twenties. Um, so we, we still see these rapid changes in how the front brain is being organized and uh, is taking control of cognitive thinking, but also emotional approaches to thinking. You can see from the graph, there's this steep leap at the age of three and four, but it's during school years kindergarten and elementary school and middle school that we really develop executive function in the brain. It's also notable that the brain's plasticity, its ability to change easily, its flexibility, is something that's a characteristic of the early life experience as well. And by the time the brain is fully wired, it becomes much more difficult and increasingly difficult with age to, to affect a change in the child's personality. There are three buckets of research and three themes that I think come out of that research indicating what it takes for a child to develop optimal cognitive skills. And one of them is nutrition. Uh, the other is nurturing, maybe the most important. It does not have to be parental nurturing. It's adult nurturing of a child. And then experiences what uh, in uh, medical schools you would call uh, epigenetics, not the genetic endowment from mom and dad, but the environmental experiences and exposures that shape that genetic potential. These three buckets are very important. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about nutrition, and I want you to appreciate something. You hear a lot of talk on the internet and in magazine articles and things about individual nutrients. Oh, you've got to have iron, and you have to have selenium and choline and uh, you know uh, omega-3 fatty acids. But the point I want to stress here is that for a child to build a brain and maintain that brain in optimal functioning capacity, it takes a lot of nutrition. And it's nutrition across the board. Every nutrient in the brain has a different and very important function. Nutrient deficiencies hamper our ability to think and react in normal ways. So the Dietary Guidelines for Americans is updated every five years. And we've used this as a guidepost to looking at the research from the last five years and coming up with a concept of what good nutrition means. And the last three dietary guidelines have stressed this important point, that if you have a quality dietary pattern, the foods that rotate in your life uh, cyclically, in and out, uh, day in, day out, week in, week out, that dietary pattern, if it's high quality, supports health across the board. So we think in terms of heart healthy diets and diabetes diets and others, but the dietary guidelines committees have been very clear. If you have a strong dietary pattern, all these health risks and mental health risks are uh, dampened down. You really improve all of your health and mental health with a good diet. What does that mean? And what's a healthful dietary pattern? 
Well, I think the one that gets the most press is the so-called Mediterranean pattern or get other ones, vegetarian pattern, the USDA pattern. They're all collections of how people eat. But I wanna stress something very important. Every person listening today has their own personal dietary pattern. No one eats the Mediterranean diet. They eat the Mediterranean diet as filtered through their own personal preferences, experiences, their culture, their family, their history. So when you make changes to your diet or anyone makes changes, it's gonna be done incrementally. You're not gonna throw over your fundamental history dietary history for some new diet, whether it's Atkins or any other diet, you're going to modify your diet. And so this is a lifelong quest where we look at the components of a healthful dietary pattern on the left, and we mix and match and try and find ways of constantly incrementally improving our patterns. How do you measure diet quality? Well, there's a number of different tools and scores that we can use looking at the diet. This is one that I prefer, the Healthy Eating Index, um, because it is directly applied to the Dietary Guidelines uh, Committee advice. And so what you see here is that the, on the top half, they wanted you to take certain um, food groups, the five food groups, fruits, vegetables, grains, particularly whole grains, uh, dairy, and quality proteins, those five food groups. And they wanted you to have enough servings in each every week. If you got those, then you get these points, maximum points, meaning you've achieved your uh, your servings of those beneficial foods. And then at the same time, they wanted us to moderate our intake of refined grains, uh, uh, sodium, sugar, and saturated fats. If you did this perfectly, you would get 100 points. Well, you can see the, uh, the most recent scores, two to five-year-olds have 59 points, six to 11, 53, 12 to 17-year-olds, 52 and 65 year olds, 68. And I, I always joke that the reason 65 year olds do that, they realize they're gonna meet their maker a lot sooner if they don't buck up and eat a good diet. And so as we get older, we, we kind of get religion there. The thing that's a little shocking here is this is out of a hundred points and no group in our country does really, really well. Um, but what's amazing here is that this is so much better than it was uh, 25 years ago. One of the reasons that this has gone so well has been school meals. We think about the nutrition safety net and we've used it twice now in the 21st century. Once when we had uh, the big recession back in 2007, 8, 9, and then most recently COVID, where the nutrition safety net the SNAP program, the WIC program, uh, child and adult uh, care feeding programs for preschoolers and seniors, and then school meals. These really put a floor under Americans and protected them. You can see the investment in school meals. We're putting in almost $20 billion a year uh, to get about 7 billion meals delivered to kids. The thing that's interesting about this is the kids who lean most heavily on school meals are the poorest kids in the country. About 55% of kids now uh, qualify for free and reduced price meals, which is a real eye opener when you think about us as a wealthy country. A lot of people aren't sharing in that wealth. And this program is incredibly important for maintaining good nutrition among the neediest students. Let me show you how those trends have changed over 10 years. And I've, I've got data from school meals that show going back to about 1995, a steady year in, year out improvement in the quality of the nutrition delivered in school. But here's the healthy eating index scores. And you can see uh, back in the 90s, we were in the low 40s among kids on average. You can see steady improvement uh, right up until 2010. And in 2010, Congress passed the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, the most important uh, revival of school meal criteria and regulations. 
And it was not easy for schools to implement this, but it really pushed school meals very closely in a line with the uh, dietary guidelines for Americans. It focused on servings, it focused on whole grains and quality uh, as a means of improving kids' nutrition. Since its implementation in 2011, 2012, there's been a tremendous surge in healthy eating scores. And here you can see where our mean is now up around 55, which is a tremendous increase from the 90s. I think if every child in the country was given school breakfast, school lunch, access to after school meals, good nutrition in the summer, you'd see a much stronger nutrition profile among kids. And this is the reason why I feel that way. This is the most recent data just published uh, last year on school meals. And when you use a healthy eating index, the alignment of school meals with the dietary guidelines, you can see that school lunches in just a matter of uh, less than a decade, less than a half a decade, school lunches went from a score of 58 to 82 out of 100, and school breakfast from a score of 50 to 71 out of 100 ideal. School meals are absolutely vital for maintaining nutrition among kids at risk in this country. Here's one of the outcroppings of the re regulation changes that have occurred uh, compared uh, to looking back earlier, if you looked at this wheel of beverage consumption, you would see big time soft drinks, fruit drinks, uh, and um, very limited amounts of milk and 100% fruit juice and water. But what you've seen most recently is this transformation. Schools have put in more uh, water and other uh, uh, nutritious drinks to replace soft drinks and fruit drinks in their vending machines and in their lines. And as a result of that, we're seeing water now take up about 43% of the beverages that kids consume. This is not the case all across the country homogeneously, unfortunately. Uh, there are big ethnic differences and big differences between uh, impoverished students and the more well-to-do students. But this type of a trend is directly the result of schools. So what's gonna happen now with, with uh, COVID and everybody last year uh, kind of got smacked with uh, the sudden changes in our environments and kids were no different. This was a much different world with them at home a good portion of the time with the hybrid model slowly coming back. And it had a big impact on their nutrition and their food security. One of the provisions that USDA had already in place, particularly for summer meals, was what was called the community eligibility provision. And what this allowed school districts and local areas in, in um, uh, rural and urban areas, it allowed them to look at the students within their area. And if the students in their area, more than 40% of them were free and reduced, they were allowed to treat all the children the same. They didn't have to gather individual student data. They could feed all children that were available to be fed. In the summertime, as you might imagine, that makes an enormous difference, allowing kids access to meal irrespective of their uh, financial um, uh, background. But in this case, in COVID, USDA uh, gave waivers to states and school districts to use this more effectively, get meals to the students, irrespective of their individual status in terms of socioeconomic status. And this really is one of the reasons that we see kids doing reasonably well, uh, despite the uh, tremendous impact of COVID. I say all that as a background, nutrition background, to talk about this one thing, how we learn. And this is something that we've gotten more and more data on, particularly in the last decade, of the steps it takes to encode a memory in deep 
storage so that we can recover it. And this is really the basis of what we're asking children to do in school. It requires their attention. It requires them to use what's called working memory, keeping that information in, in front of them and sifting it through what they already know. And then they encode that memory, store it, and it's available for retrieval. Well, this is what the brain looks like when it's fasted and fed. The upper panel is a brain scan and you have to imagine yourself laying on the ground and looking up at this uh, dude. And what you're seeing is the front brain on the top and the uh, rear brain on the bottom there. And the area that's lighting up in blue is the area that's most active in the brain of a fasting uh, uh, human. What you see there is that midbrain. Remember we talked about the amygdala, the emotional center of the brain. The midbrain here is very active. It's in food seeking mode. It's easily distracted. It's irritable. It's looking for food. It needs glucose at that moment. In the bottom panel, you see what happens when that glucose, when that meal is supplied and breaks the fast. The prefrontal cortex lights up and this is a very different uh, person. This is someone who is calm, focused, attentive and ready to learn. So you look at these two panels and you understand why it is that it's so different when a child is given breakfast, a good quality breakfast, and then asked to learn something relative to the child who doesn't get breakfast and is asked to tackle learning. The science is overwhelming. We've got even more. I like this particular review from about a decade ago because it looked at 45 different student studies and all of them showed beneficial effects of breakfast when it's provided to kids. The kids who got the most out of breakfast were the most vulnerable and the most at risk. It helped with memorization and math. It gave them better attention and satiety. They were just more ready to learn. And that's what the science uh, continues to say as studies keep coming out. One of the reasons it's so important um, is, th is that it be a quality breakfast is because if you give a low quality kind of high carbohydrate Cinnabon like breakfast in the morning, that's not very well balanced. You get a surge of glucose, but it disappears as fast as it comes. And so what school meals have been working is trying to get different components in that meal, uh, fruit, dairy, and grains together that really dampens that surge in blood sugar and lets it have a long tail getting out from eight to nine to 10 to 11. This is achieved the more you can make that meal complex, not simple starches, but complex whole grains and fibers mixed with proteins and fats. These are things that can make an enormous difference. Uh, Deloitte did a study for uh, Share Our Strength, uh, one of the great organizations in the US, and they were able to show that uh, breakfast in school was associated with not just less hunger and more attention, fewer behavior problems, but as was mentioned in the video that Sarah showed, better attendance and less tardiness, fewer visits to the school nurse for stomach aches and headaches in mid-morning, lower obesity rates, better math scores, and higher graduation rates. So we took this information um, and began, all of us began to really talk about the importance of breakfast. Well, you can see since the year 2000, um, we've doubled the number of kids eating breakfast and 85% of them are free and reduced price. So these were kids who were poor and needed the breakfast, but weren't getting it previously and this has been a rapid transformation in our schools. A lot of that has to do with school food service doing innovations. Instead of putting kids into the cafeteria altogether, they did this grab and go sequence where they could either grab it and eat quickly uh, or grab it and take it back to the classroom. For COVID, this has been a real godsend because it allowed kids to uh, stay socially distanced in the classroom, but at the same time get access to breakfast. 
The other thing we have data on is the impact of physical activity on brain function. And it's pretty simple to understand why. It increases blood flow. That brings glucose and oxygen to the brain. It improves attention and therefore helps with encoding memory. It's a very important piece of all this. And one of the things that has come out is this thing called wakeful rest, where you're awake, but you're, you're resting phase. You're not uh, um, amped up and hyper. And what a lot of academics are realizing is that to encode information and get it into storage that you can recover, you need a brief recess, a brief period of uh, wakeful rest after intense learning. And so this concept of the 50 minute hour has been uh, espoused in Scandinavian countries, in Japan, and even here in the US and places in uh, Canada and Texas, we've seen uh, places try using these brain breaks to allow encoding to take place. The other thing that of course has happened in COVID that's devastating and Sarah talked about it quite eloquently is the need for peer to peer interaction. Kids develop their executive skills and their social and emotional skills on the playground with each other. It can't be taught in the way that you teach math. It's something that is learned by doing with each other. And one of the biggest devastating things of COVID was interrupting the ability of kids to use socialization to advance their own development. Um, we did a, a, pay, a policy statement for the Academy of Pediatrics called the crucial role of recess that went through all of the reasons why recess is so valuable and should never be taken away from children for academic or behavioral reasons. Those social and emotional skills that Sarah mentioned are the kind of skills that we all value in our peers when we're working with other people on teams or uh, in, in uh, various guises. We value the people who know how to work with other people. And as I said, this is practiced on the playground. This is child to child. This is kind of an unstructured learning experience. So we want to build a really good environment in school, and then let the children help each other develop these social and emotional skills through grade school, middle school, all the way through high school and into college. I wanna show you a couple of other pieces of, of uh, uh, science. Here's the science on sleep deprivation. As you already know, I think a lot of teenagers are sleep deprived. They need more hours of sleep per night than most of the rest of us do. Um, but also you may not know, 30% of the kids entering kindergarten have sleep disorders. So uh, this is a common American problem. Well, you can see in the brain scan, again, you're laying on the ground looking at the uh, front of the face is on top and the back of the head is on the bottom. And you can see in sleep deprived people, it's the midbrain, it's the amygdala, the emotional center. It's firing, this is an inattentive person who cannot learn in that circumstance. A well-conditioned uh, uh, person who's had plenty of sleep comes into an environment to learn. They're attentive and they're fixed and they're ready to go. These uh, kids need this. Sleep should be a very important part of school uh, discussion with the school nurses and the, and the faculty because this is a much, much better student if they get enough sleep at home. And then the last thing I'll show you here is depression, same story. A depressed brain is a midbrain that's lighting up because the person simply doesn't have the attention, the energy, and the emotional stability to approach uh, learning and difficult tasks. That's a front brain skill. And you can see the person who's not depressed has this diffuse electrical activity across the brain. And that's what we're looking for in our students. So I've said this many times, working together, all of us in, in a community uh, around schools, we can put a better student in the chair that lets the teacher teach. Uh, so the whole child model really has opened up the school to an understanding of what it takes 
to learn. And as we get more and more evidence, we get better attuned to ways of making this happen. A really, really uh, vital uh, advance from CDC was building this model and letting the schools begin to run with it. So I'll just say one thing. There's a number of grants available. I'm just giving you a few examples here that can be obtained for schools to implement some of the things around this whole child model. Um, the one from Fuel Up to Play 60, for example, focuses on student ideas and getting the students uh, who working to improve their own school. Action for Healthy Kids uh, takes a different tack working with parents and other people from the community coming in to help the school uh, develop these things. The Dairy Council, of course, has always been available for nutrition and support. And then finally, building healthy communities is one of the most important uh, things that we can do where uh, the school is considered a part of the community and there's ways of strengthening the environment around all children uh, at that time. So thank you all for attending this conference. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and work with you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Greatly appreciate that. Um, I think before we end today, uh, we'll have a few questions in the queue. But first, I'd like to do uh, another poll just to kind of see where we're at on this youth wellness uh, topic. And let's see here. So our second question is, now that you know a little bit about the components of youth wellness that were talked about in the WISP model and that Dr. Murray provided, um, what are the areas that you feel like you can impact as a community member? I'll give everybody just a few minutes here. It was really interesting uh, as far as, you know, hearing the information about the WISC model. Um, and I knew I, I'm not an educator in as far as teachers for K through 12 schools. And, and this was something that, you know, really struck me too. Like, what is it that I can do personally? And hopefully from the messages today, several of you will be able to, to find some things. Just another couple seconds here to vote and then we'll we'll get to questions as well because we do have a couple of, of good ones in the in the queue. Okay, let's see here. Well, this is this is really interesting. Let me share these results. Uh, it looks like the top winner was nutrition, environment, and services. So that maybe tells me that we have either some dietitians or some dietetic students uh, potentially uh, on this, or maybe they work in school food service uh, potentially as well. Um, but it's spread out pretty well here, I think, as far as a community goes. Um, certainly health education and just community involvement each are above uh, 50%. So um, very exciting. And I'm so glad that many of you were able to find some ways that you could participate as well. I'm going to move to questions here. And let's see. Um, let's start with our first question. Oh, Alice, Alyssa asked if the video would be shared. And I believe that's from uh, Dr. Lee's presentation. And we do have a link to that. So we'll make sure that that gets shared out to everyone as well. Um, then this next question, actually, I was uh, really curious about myself. Um, one of our attendees asked, so they appreciated that the primary focus of the webinar is youth, but also recognizing that some of the participants may be college faculty. Is there any evidence that the WISC model would have similar benefits for college age students if it was implemented, implemented at the collegiate level? I'm not aware for sure, but um, Dr. Murray or Dr. Lee, are you aware? Well, well I will reiterate that the, the brain is still developing in college. Um, and there, you know, we do get this uh, burst of midbrain growth early in teen years. And then we also get after that 
an expansion of front brain executive skills that continue to refine and develop until about the mid 20s. And I can tell you, having had three kids, you can actually see the difference between, between someone who's coming out of college and someone who's in their late 20s, the, you appreciate their adultness and the way they approach difficulties. Uh, so yes, it, it is important in college. We're finding out a lot of things about college. Food insecurity is much higher than we thought it was. Their nutrition is terrible in college. And, and it's most a threat going forward into later adulthood for women because they're moving from college into childbearing years and they're taking that diet with them. And that has an impact on the fetus and the child. And uh, those are all those epigenetic uh, implications. And so, and I also think uh, we don't always appreciate um, mental health problems among uh, collegiate students and some of the stress they're under. Uh, it's a big problem. This year was devastating for them because they lost their whole social community along with, uh, with their academic uh, performance. So yes, this, is, this applies to elementary school all the way through college. Um, and, and it's something we should pay attention to. Sarah, I don't know if you have another uh, focus on that you want to add. No, I think you really covered it. And I think it would be really nice to have some studies that look at this WISC type approach in a college setting to look at really kind of where the levers of change are across a model like that within the college and university setting and how much, you know, one of the things I was thinking that what's, you know, what is unique here um, or more unique within the college and university setting are all of the social, um, athletic, other extracurricular clubs that exist that are really, those do exist at, in K through 12 settings, but much more so at the college level and what role those have um, in addressing health, wellness and academic achievement as well. And it would just be interesting to see this within a research study, but I don't have much to add. I agree with what you've shared and the mental health piece is enormous. Um, and I, I, I really hope we see not just more research, but more resources and tools and support to go out across the K-12 and the, and the college settings. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you both. I do have a couple other questions here. Um, one is uh, several problems that were mentioned. I believe this goes back to Dr. Murray's presentation. Um, stemmed from the insufficient frontal lobe development. Do you have any suggestions for ways to help kids strengthen that area of development? That's an excellent question. And yes, there are a number of um, research projects that have looked at how do we strengthen executive functions and what things can be done. And uh, so we're seeing, um, I'll just mention a couple that, that I'm aware of. Harvard has a, a thing on early child brain development, a, a center, and they have a lot of information about this kind of thing. There is a, a group called CASEL, which is the Center for Social and Emotional Learning, and they've talked a lot about these kind of things. Um, they're not exactly the same. The executive skills, I think, a lot have to do with your approach to problem solving and learning and uh, overcoming obstacles. And social and emotional skills have more to do with your the subtlety of your emotional makeup and how you use that in conjunction with executive skills. But those two things can be trained. They are learned, they are skills. And so uh, schools, preschools, after school programs can all take part in that. Excellent. I think we have two more questions. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes we can maybe get to here. Uh, the first one is as a college student, um, they know that, the that there are benefits to sleep and due to a lot of homework and stress, how can they educate older students on sleep and when they know uh, the effects of sleep but can't really get enough? <laughs> well, I think you, you, you do well to make that time for yourself to the extent possible. There's quality studying time and then there's quantity studying time. As a medical student, I can tell you the difference between the two. I think the, the sleep really uh, is 
absolutely vital to good function. A lot of things change. Our metabolism changes, the way we eat changes, you know, our, our attitude, our approach, our memory. Uh, so I would carve out enough sleep. Not everybody needs 12 hours, but uh, most people need six to eight hours at minimum, or they simply don't function well. Thank you. Appreciate that, Dr. Marie. Last question that we have time for. Um, has any data been collected with homeschool students? Hmm. I saw that question. Not that I am aware of, although I am sure that data collection exists. Um, if it doesn't, it would be surprising. And it certainly is an area of inquiry that I, that I think would be really interesting. Um, both looking at the approaches that homeschool um, scenarios use to address health and academics, but also the health behaviors, attitudes, beliefs of students who are in a homeschool um, scenario. I think it's a really interesting question, but I don't know data sources, do you? I don't, um, yeah, I, I, I've seen academic write-ups about you know, successful models for academic learning, but um, I guess I've always thought as a pediatrician of the social and emotional impact first, and how do we guarantee that those kids have access to each other uh, in order to develop those skills that are so vital. Sure. Okay. You know, there's a study, and I, I can just kind of end with this, Anna, but there's a study that showed that those social and emotional skills that kids develop and you can measure them early in life and you can predict how they're going to develop over time. Those kids who have really strong social emotional skills do really well academically and socially and professionally and it's a better predictor of success than IQ. So it isn't, it isn't what your genes are doing but it's that environment, it makes a big difference. Isn't that incredible? And, and I love ending on that note because I do feel like we have so many community members who are doing a variety of things in their individual fields that are on this uh, presentation today. And uh, hopefully that this gives them just some further ideas or information that they can go to and, and think about the ways that they can impact that in students. Um, at this point, I'm going to thank everybody for participating today and just remind you, we will have this, it is recording, so we will share that out with everyone as long, uh, along with a PDF of uh, the slides for today in case there was anything that you might have missed um, and continuing education certificates for the groups that we have those for. Um, please feel free if you have any additional questions. Uh, again, my name is Hannah Kelly. And I am the dietitian that is working with as the director of health and wellness for the Dairy Association here in Indiana. Uh, my email address is kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y, at winnersdrinkmilk.com. And I would be more than happy to um, answer any additional questions or field those out to Dr. Murray or Dr. Lee if we have anything that comes up after the fact. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.